good evening, everybody, uh, from a very cold and wintry uh, Cape Town. It's almost dark outside already. And I just want to say thank you very much to Mati for putting this webinar together. Um, just to remind people that SAPA now has a new website and our address is pediatrics.org.za. Lots of really interesting things to find on that website. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a little bit of time looking around. Our whole aim for SAPA is that we are actually an organization that is an umbrella that allows for unity amongst anybody interested in children's health. And so we encourage people to converse, to reach out to colleagues in other pediatric disciplines, um, and to spend some time looking at the website and not only giving us positive feedback, but also giving ideas of how else you can actually be helpful in the pediatric world. So tonight we have a very interesting webinar um, based on feeding. Um, and uh, that's a really interesting topic. I see we already have quite a few people. So the topic tonight is pediatric feeding and swallowing. What's all the fuss? So I'm going to stop sharing now. Dirk, you should be able to share your screen if you're wanting to use slides. So Dirk von Delft is a pediatric surgeon, and I'm going to give him the honor of being an honorary pediatrician as well. So um, he works at Red Cross um, Children's Hospital at the moment, but he's got extensive experience in the Eastern Cape and has also done lots of international training. Um, and really gets it when it comes to pediatric problems. And I think the fact that he's got a very handsome young man called Finn in his life has also possibly added to him getting an honorary pediatrician status. So Dirk, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Minion and Vivian. Thank you uh, for um, the presentation to which I really can't add much, so I'll keep it very short so that I think the bigger component here would be questions that people might have as to um, what, what, what can one offer surgically for those who have problematic swallowing or problematic reflux uh, or problematic dysphagia or failure to thrive due to a uh, an inherent um, swallowing or feeding problem. And I think you've explained, Vivian has explained the, the complexity of the process and the extent to which the, the workup needs to be done very, very well. So there's, there isn't really much for me to add. So I'll keep what I have to say very brief. So the, <clears throat> the important thing I think, which was also highlighted by Vivian is that the whole workup that is done by the um, speech and language uh, together with radiology is to make sure that the diagnosis is correct and that the disorder is properly defined. And then, of course, in the in the workup, a number of things will come up. Um, and again, as has been pointed out, that one asks oneself very carefully, what is it that one is trying to show or prove with the investigation that is done. Um, it is never helpful to say, let's do the study and see what comes up. It's always far more productive to say, these are our hypotheses, these are the problems we would like to resolve, and how can we best go about it, and which study is going to give us the best answer. And I'm very glad that there was also a video fluoroscopy that showed um, and I, I won't use the, the modified barium swallow uh, any, anymore, and I'll, I'll be resistant to anybody that does use it. But the video fluoroscopy study that showed a laryngeal cleft, um, because that illustrates these unforeseen rare conditions that one can find. And I think the further issue is um, the involvement of the ear, ear nose, and throat specialists with, who have a particular interest and a skill in doing the um, flexible um, laryngopharyngoscopy to look for these sort of things and to confirm them. And we can see on the on the images here on the on the very left where my cursor is, that's a normal larynx with normal vocal cords and a normal posterior laryng laryngeal wall, i.e. The, the, the barrier to um, 
aspiration through a cleft into the larynx. And in, at the bottom here, that's where the, the, the esophagus would open. And then in, in the next one, it's extremely subtle, but one can see there what a cleft, a, a type one cleft would look like all the way through to a type four cleft, where basically the cleft goes all the way down to the carina where one can see that. And of course, as has been pointed out, this is not something that one would be able to assess clinically alone. And even with a fluoroscopy, if one isn't careful, one may miss a type one or even a type two cleft. Um, and, and similarly with, with the soft palate lesions and the velopalatine muscles, dysfunction in that region, um, it is, can be very tricky. And so it, I think it's very important that one knows that there are other things that one might have to look for and how to best find them. So I, I think it's very important that, that, that this is highlighted um, before one embarks on the studies that one would like to do. I think other things that one needs to look at, uh, surgical conditions, for instance, would be vocal cord palsy or paresis. And they may not be evident unless one has a good history of what has happened to the child before, uh, for instance, uh, types of thoracic or cardiac surgery that may have been involved, um, whether there are neurological conditions that may lead to vocal cord palsy, previous intubation attempts, placement of, of central venous axis catheters, et cetera, et cetera, uh, anything that may lead to an injury to the nerve that supplies the vocal cords. Um, Congenital disorders, laryngeal clefts, cleft palate, which is uh, unrecognized, previous esophageal atresia, uh, distal esophageal narrowing, which, which may be completely unrecognized for, for quite a while until uh, disordered feeding or swallowing becomes apparent. And, uh, and the image that Vivian showed of the multiple strictures in the esophagus um, is, is a wonderful example where, where one might think that there is a swallowing uh, disorder higher up in the in in the, uh, the pharynx, when in fact the problem is further distally. Um, mediastinal masses, achalasia, antral webs, um, undiagnosed pyloric stenosis in those uh, infants in, in whom that age group that uh, may still be relevant. Duodenal stenosis, uh, malrotation, duplication cysts both in the esophagus and in the stomach and duodenum, for instance. Previous congenital diaphragmatic hernia or diaphragmatic eventration where the crura of the diaphragm will be affected. So these are all conditions <clears throat> that are going to either cause problematic swallowing or precipitate problematic reflux that may not be apparent um, during, during the initial workup. And, and one needs to be very, very cognizant of these things. And one shouldn't exclude medical conditions such as food allergies, which may precipitate the pro uh, problematic uh, gastroesophageal reflux, inborn areas of metabolism that may cause all sorts of problems, uh, such as metabolic acidosis. There are those children that may have cyclical vomiting, and um, please don't involve me if you ever have one of these. It's extremely problematic to deal with self induced vomiting and then other causes of raised intracranial pressure uh, and the list. Um, does go on. So it does become really important to, to have an, a, a good reason why one chooses the, the study that one does and be, be aware of the associated problems. And things like mediastinal masses and the small indentations that can be made on a contrast study uh, due to duplication cysts of the esophagus or mediastinal masses can easily be missed and I haven't even included the vascular rings that may cause uh, esophageal obstruction and as a consequence lead to lead to uh, feeding difficulties. And then in our population, big mediastinal nodes due to tuberculosis or a patient that uh, uh, our pulmonologists are very familiar with um, an esophageal bronchial fistula due to TB nodes that are eroded. All of these things play a role. And then, of course, cr chronic malnutrition, um, for other reasons, may precipitate problematic feeding. Um, just to highlight a few of these, for instance, what I really appreciated was um, Vivian mentioning the different phases of the swallow and where different people will be looking. The speech and language therapist will be looking up in the upper regions of the neck, the larynx, the laryngeal penetration, 
and spillage, etc. And the radiologists will focus their attention on the length of the esophagus and the gastroesophageal uh, junction and the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, what one does often see with the um, modified contrast study or the, the video fluoroscopy is that the image is cut off once the contrast enters the stomach. And so the second part of this useful study is often not included um, unless one specifies that there is a concern that something else may be going on. And over here, one can see that there is an, uh, an uh, antral web uh, on the left-hand side under the cursor that is the fluoroscopic view of it. And one can see the narrowing and the tiny channel before the contrast goes into the pylorus proper. And on the right-hand side, one can see the endoscopic view of this little web that will cause a significant obstruction even to liquid uh, media to go through. Um, the other condition that can cause a gastric outlet obstruction that may not be apparent if one doesn't continue the contrast study all the way through is a malrotation. And I want to stress the fact that malrotation can take place without volvulus. It can just cause chronic obstruction and chronic problematic reflux or vomiting due to the way that the duodenum is stretched out and tethered behind these bands called lab bands. Um, and one can often see in the contrast study that the duodenum has become bulbous, as one can see over here. But there is no apparent bulbulus. And then something else which um, often contributes to regurgitation or, or reflux are hiatal hernias. And one can see again, this should be apparent on a video fluoroscopy fluoroscopic study as the gastroesophageal entry is uh, observed and one should see, see whether the hiatus hernia is there. And this can not only precipitate reflux but also disordered swallowing because this uh, lower part of the esophagus should be in the uh, in the abdomen and the fact that it is, sits higher up here will have a consequence to the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation when the peristaltic wave comes through and there may in fact be a holdup because food residue is retained in this small amount of stomach that is sitting above the diaphragm. So that, that in itself may cause disordered swallowing, even if reflux symptoms aren't apparent. All right, so from a surgeon, surgeon's perspective, um, I think it is important to be very involved in the workup of these patients and to be very aware what the team is up to. Uh, and I, I think it is no good being at the end of the referral pattern and receiving a patient that, uh, with a request, please do this procedure or please place this tube. I think uh, a lot of misunderstanding takes place this way. And it's very difficult then to know what the expectations are and to constructively engage with the parents and the patient to understand what the expectations of the parents are and the patient in particular. And again, this is what something that Vivian highlighted very, uh, uh, very well in, in the beginning of her talk is that every family and every patient will have their own dynamics and their own problems and their own limitations of resources and their own tolerance of problems that they can deal with. And unless one knows these things in advance and unless one actively engages with these um, it is very difficult to find the correct solution because it isn't the case of the child has diagnosis X with problem Y, therefore the surgical intervention is Z. Um, that, that is just not a, an a algorithm that's going to work because the, 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 the understanding of what parents and patients will want and what they perceive their problem to be is often very different from what we perceive the problem to be and our solutions are not necessarily their solutions. Um, so I think what I would like to say is that get to know the patient, get to know the problem, understand the patient's expectations uh, to the last detail of what those might be, understand the patient's resource limits, um, and understand how long their road has been with this problem and what they hope, because some patients will think that the surgery will resolve all the problems and cure the child, where in fact all you are going to be able to do is provide a conduit for feeding for instance. Um, I think it's important to be involved with the decisions regarding the diagnostic tests 
and know how these tests are done. And I think the, the, the presentation here uh, and the detailed exp explanation of what the video fluoroscopy can and cannot do is very important. Um, it is useful to know that it's not just a simple test where contrast is given and that's it, but that a lot of different things are taken into consideration um, how this patient feeds and what the consistencies are, et cetera, et cetera, because that really will inform how one uh, goes about doing surgery if it is necessary. And when possible, it is very useful and informative uh, to attend the exams. And if one can't attend those examinations, at least to discuss the, the, the recorded uh, video loops with the um, speech and language therapist that did them um, in, in the multidisciplinary team meeting where the outcome uh, is discussed, because it's really useful to know the details of what was, what was um, attempted and what one was looking for and little things that may have been overlooked and there's concerns that one might have regarding the surgery that is proposed. And then it, I think it's very important to be very clear about the usefulness and the success of the surgical interventions. I don't think there's any use in being overly optimistic about things that may not work or being overly pessimistic about things uh, where the patients may have prior experience of this procedure uh, or may have read up about the procedure or are very aware of the potential complications but find that the complications may be completely acceptable if the improvement in the in, in the symptomatology um, or the feeding um, is acceptable and then i think it's very important to be able to be prepared to follow up these patients regarding the surgical intervention and as part of the, the bigger team that is looking after patients with feeding and swallowing problems. Um, there will inevitably be um, complications. There will inevitably be, be expectations that are unmet. There will inevitably be device failure. Um, and there will inevitably be those patients that, who are very happy. And that's often very nice to, to hear that the work that one does is very good. And then I think as a, as a further um, Piece of advice it's extremely important to prepare the patients ex very well to what what they are going to have to deal with and this is especially important with the tubes i think a tube uh, a pre-operative tube training uh, session to make sure that the patients will be able to handle the device that is being implanted uh, gastrostomy tube training nasogastric tube training is is vitally important and one has seen the success of the tracheostomy training program uh, at Red Cross Children's Hospital, which has made it possible for, for patients to go home with very complex uh, devices, even home-based ventilation and uh, CPAP uh, devices um, with, with very low complication rates and complications that can be mostly managed by the patients themselves. So I think it's, it's extremely important also for the longevity of these devices, and especially in the case of stomas, that the patients know how to deal with the stoma long before they even uh, have the, the stoma made or long before their child has, made, has had the stoma made. And I think it's very important to recognize that most children can learn. They can learn very complex things. Most of us learn to speak by the age of two and a half. We are versant in our language which is one of the most complex things we will ever do in our lives is to speak. Um, and so I think it's very important that we recognize that children can learn to use these devices and they can be very vocal about what they uh, would like and how they would like them and, and to engage very actively with the children about this. Okay, I'm going to go through a couple of, of, of devices and then I'm going to leave it at that. And if there is time for questions in that, uh, then I'm happy to take them. I think the, the simplest um, device with which one can get food past the esophagus and into the stomach is the nasogastric tube. And they have come a very long way from the early beginnings where it was simply a, a natural rubber tube of a, a rather large cap, uh, diameter that was um, put down the either the mouth or the nose to devices which now can be placed, um, as we can see down here, by the patients themselves at home. Um, or by the patient's parents um, in a very safe manner. These tubes are safe, they're cheap, cheap. they can be a long-term option uh, if in many instances. They can be used for home-based feeding programs. 
They can be self-placed or parent placed with minimal complications. And the beautiful thing about this, it's a fully reversible conduit with which to provide feeding. I think also we've moved away from children walking around with their face plas faces plastered up and the tube being draped over the ear. And these devices may have a bridle which goes around the boma of the nasal septum and anchors it very securely, makes loss of a tube extremely unlikely and certainly we use this in the burns patients and increasingly in children who have had surgery for esophageal atresia to make sure that the device is not lost. So this is the, the, the simplest device and I think uh, any, any uh, unit that deals with feeding problems should have a big repertoire of uh, these, these available. They should use the most contemporary modern ones. Um, the additional cost for these bridles is really not high considered that it keeps patients out of hospital and out of OPDs. And these can be placed with minimal training um, by the parents themselves. Uh, sorry, I should go back one. Um, gastrostomies. So gastrostomies are also very, very popular. And I think there are a few things that we need to uh, understand about gastrostomies. Gastrostomy is simply the term used for a, uh, an opening through the anterior abdominal wall directly into the stomach where the stomach is fixed to the anterior abdominal wall to make sure that the stoma doesn't come away from the skin. And the gastrostomy can be done in various ways. It can be a simple open, uh, open stoma or a device can be placed which can either be a tube or a skin level button device. And as such, it, is, uh, it appears fairly simple. It can be very useful, especially in extremely long-term uh, conduits. Um, it has its costs uh, associated with it and it has complications and it has complications and it has a lot of complications and these complications can only be minimized if the parent and the patient are fully engaged trained extremely well and understand how to use and care for these stomas and uh, how to make sure that early mishaps are immediately reported and dealt with there are different placement techniques it can be done as an open surgical procedure it can be done with laparoscopy or as a percutaneous endoscopic procedure, uh, which is probably the simplest uh, and quickest, but also the one with the potentially most devastating complications that may go unrecognized for a while. Um, a PEG is not a gastrostomy. I just want to highlight this since there's a big audience. A PEG is a procedure. It is a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy placement. And what is done here is that an endoscope is placed through the uh, esophagus into the stomach. The light is uh, shone through the anterior abdominal wall. And then a needle is placed from the outside through the skin. And through that, a lead wire is placed, which is grasped through the endoscope. This is then pulled out through the mouth, as one can see. And then the uh, tube is pulled through the mouth, out through the uh, anterior abdominal wall. And it is anchored with this bumper device. Um, a, so the PEG is the procedure, the device is a percutaneous endoscopically placed gastrostomy tube. And the confusion, the use of using this interchangeably is that often a child is referred for a change of a PEG and then one prepares for an endoscopic procedure, whereas in fact if it one had just said that there is a gastrostomy device with a balloon on it, one didn't need all the rigmarole of doing this. So uh, the details do matter here a little bit. The complications that one can get with, with endoscopically placed gastrostomies is, of course, that uh, if the colon lies draped over the anterior wall of the stomach, this needle can be placed through the colon and one may not recognize this. Uh, if the stomach is rotated with the posterior wall of the stomach sitting anteriorly, as one gets with a transaxial um, torsion of the stomach, one can place this through the posterior wall and the stomach will then be fixed in that position and this can lead to emptying problems as the antrum of the stomach will be twisted as will be the first part of the duodenum and a further problem can be that if this placement is too far distal this bumper may in fact lie right at the pylorus and obstructus and this is a particular problem with balloon uh, anchored devices a further problem that is inherent to all gastrostomy devices, whether they are tubes or, um, or buttons, is that 
if again if placed too close to pylorus or if the, the 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 tube is not properly anchored that this balloon can migrate and through peristalsis be dragged into the pyloric canal and thereby causing obstruction and the problem then of course is if one just pulls the tube back and without deflating the balloon that one will cause a reverse interception of the duodenum into the stomach and that all will be anchored up against the anterior abdominal wall and the gastric emptying won't be relieved. So the, the, the way of readjusting a gastrostomy tube needs to be taught very well. And in all instances, the balloon needs to be deflated before one pulls a tube back to reposition it. Complications, as I mentioned, they are there. The parents need to be made aware. Gastric perforation, esophageal perforation, gas, uh, colocutaneous fistula, as I've indicated, uh, gastric outlet obstruction, necrotizing fasciitis, in, if an inflammatory process like this becomes secondarily infected, and one can have slow creeping fasciitis, which may not be apparent on the skin. It may be in the fascia layers between. Then, of course, if there's behiscence or the dropping away of the stomach from the anterior abdominal wall, one can get intraperitoneal leakage of gastric content and feed. It may not lead to frank peritonitis in the first few hours or even the first few days. And if I operated on one such abdomen that was full of feed without the child being overtly peritonitic, I would have operated on a number. Um, and then minor complications would be gastroesophageal erosion, although I don't see how that is minor, temporary ileus, hematoma, tube dislodgement. And these stoma, these gastrostomies can close over quite rapidly if the, the uh, device that has been placed in there falls out. Wound infection, and then of course aspiration. And tube clogging, clogging especially with the use of omeprazole and other uh, thickened uh, substances. There are a number of different devices, and I'm sure the different stoma departments are well versed with them. I just want to point out to the balloon anchored gastrostomy tube and here is a rubber bumper uh, anchored tube and this is in particular a percutaneously endoscopically placed gastrostomy tube this is the button that anchors it uh, and it is not deflatable and then one has a lo lovely array of uh, skin level devices of which this one and this one are the, the probably the most comfortable to use as they are extremely flat and this one doesn't even have a balloon so it doesn't perish over time and lasts a lot longer. Further feeding tubes can be gastrojejunal tubes, which is a long, a much longer tube, which has the same skin level device, an anchoring balloon, and then this long tube that goes through the duodenum and is placed into the uh, into the small bowel. And of course, the limitation of this tube is, is that you cannot do bolus feeds through this, but it has to be continuous feeding because of the physiology and the dynamics of the food ending up directly in the small bowel without first being exposed to the gastric um, digestive enzymes and acids. And this is, again is a conversation one needs to have with the uh, dietetics uh, specialist to adjust the feed, it, feed accordingly. Um, the skin level device is much the same. One must just be aware that there are now three ports, one for the balloon, one for the jejunal uh, feed and one for the gastric port that can be used for venting or uh, for medications that have to be exposed to gastric content before they can be uh, activated or become relevant to, to the pharmacokinetics. Um, the lisophonification I'm not going to dwell on much since it's a part that will relate to reflux and I think the fundification is a a decision that one comes to after one has exhausted all other forms of, uh, of, of uh, attempts at feeding at, and preventing reflux. Um, and I think for the purpose of this conversation, I will leave that open to questions. And I will end my talk there as well and leave uh, time for questions if there are any. Great, thank you very much, Dirk. That was great. Um, I'm just looking in the chat, I can't see. Uh, any questions at the moment? Um, there's one that is, please give us your opinion on using thickened formula versus non-thickened in premature babies with immature and stressed guts, and then what thickener is used? So I don't know if that needs to go to Vivian or to yourself. 
I think that would go to Vivian. Um, I think just in, in terms of second seeds that I use in conjunction with tube seeds, it's obviously very tricky, but again, it's a very important thing to know um, if there is a, uh, a need for second seeds with a, a gastrostomy tube, for instance, that one accounts for this so that one can put an appropriately, appropriately large um, gastroscopy and gastroscopy device in. I mean, um, I actually don't think it's a <laughs> question that I, I know the answer, um, but it's more a question for a dietitian or a pediatrician, I would think. Um, no, second feeds are not recommended in premature infants. There's quite a lot of literature that that advises against it because of um, high risk of complications, but I am not the person to answer that. I think that's a pediatrician, a neonatologist or a dietitian who should take that on. Okay, and then does a peg worsen reflux is the next question. Um, so the classic teaching is that with a change in the angle of his, which is the angle between the fundus and the and the uh, esophagus itself, if that angle angle is made less acute, then one of the barriers to reflux is breached, and that could, in theory, worsen reflux. Um, so the answer is yes, it can. But will it worsen reflux? The answer is maybe. <laughs> and one needs to, that's, uh, so it's very important to, consider, to, to be able to quantify how bad is the reflux at this point in time? And is the reflux problematic? And then to, as I said, follow up with patients after a gastroscopy device has been placed to see whether the reflux has become any worse or not, and whether things have remained the same. And in some instances, in fact, it may make it may make matters uh, um, better because you no longer need the esophagus uh, as your conduit, and and this ordered peristalsis is, is no longer in play. So the esophagus is always empty um, unless there is an episode of reflux and that empties more quickly than the esophagus that is um, not emptied properly during disordered swallowing. So yes, a, a gastroscopy device can make reflux worse, but the angle of his is not the only story. And so it is not an absolute that if you put a gastroscopy device in, that you will end up with a worsened reflux because you may in fact have a very good um, uh, cruer of the diaphragm um, and you may have adequate uh, mucosal rosette there and you're, you may not have disturbed the vagus nerve at all and your esophagophrenic ligament is still intact. So you are not, you're not breaching everything. Um, and in fact, the patient may, may gain weight through your gastroscopy feeding and therefore um, the tissues themselves may be healthier over time and outgrow the reflux. So, so the answer is yes, it can, but maybe. Okay, and then I'm going to let one more question go. What would be the indication for a gastrojejunal tube? In, a, in an instance where one wants to bypass the pylorus and the duodenum completely, uh, because for, of, for instance, for intractable gastroesophageal reflux, in a patient where, um, where a nissen fundal application would be undesirable or where a nissen fundal application would become very problematic, mm. um, one can consider this. And for instance, if one has a patient who's extremely malnourished, who needs to gain weight, but has got severe reflux, which has not responded to any medical intervention whatsoever. Operating on a severely malnourished patient is never a good idea. And performing a missing fund application, which are prone to falling apart, which are prone to um, the posterior crural defect that needs to be repaired falling apart and then the missing fundoplication will slip through the diaphragm and now you have a, 
wrap above the diaphragm acting like a block in the is hernia. You may want to feed such a child first and get them to grow. And in these cases, a gastrojejunal tube would be extremely useful. Um, there are children in whom the, the uh, even the even a well-positioned and loosely fashioned wrap will this will cause an obstruction to swallowing so that their saliva swallowing their saliva becomes problematic. Um, and so one may consider that for them this may not be the best um, option either, although the reflux would be sufficiently severe to cause gastroesophageal reflux disease and one would want to prevent uh, gastric content from uh, filling up the stomach and for these children the gastrojejunal tube would be useful would be useful as well. Um, and then those that have had that have had multiple problems from previous surgery and, and have a destroyed lower esophageal sphincter or have had uh, perforations of the lower esophagus into the pleural cavity, etc., where one wants to bypass that area completely, one would use them. Um, and it's not frequently used, but certainly it is uh, it is available, but it is also problematic and needs to be carefully positioned uh, before one embarks on this. I think that just leads me to say thank you very much to Vivian and to Dirk for two really interesting presentations. It's a very topical issue, this, um, and something that most of us actually have to deal with on quite a frequent basis. Um, I must congratulate both of you on getting the numbers of the participants right up to almost 100 um, at the peak of your talk, which is unusual. Normally, people start getting tired as the talk goes on. So thank you very much for keeping everybody's interests. Um, I'm just going to just remind you again, next month in last uh, Wednesday of the month, anemia in children and neonates, update on transfusion triggers. I think that's pretty important. Remember our new website and don't forget to register for the SARPA Congress, the 13th to the 15th of August. And with that, um, unless Marty's got anything else to add, Marty, the last comment? No, just thank you so much to the speakers and really appreciate it and hope to see you all um, next month. Thank Brilliant. you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for being such an a, a inclusive group of people. Thank you very much. See you in a month. Bye.